So first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in this meeting. And um, so I will try to um, maybe share with you some ideas, some feelings about what we have been living. And I would like to thank you, Joe, and thank you all, because you are trying I hope to make the world more equitable. And, um, and I think that's something that we all had to praise. So first of all, I just want to focus on, on what are we living, right? We knew that health issues in the 21st century um, were going to be complex for the whole world. And we were discussing that. Uh, finally, we recognized that we were sharing vulnerabilities, at least, at least we were recognizing it in words. We were talking about demographic changes, people were getting older, and that was causing a shift in diseases with epidemiological transmission, double burden of diseases. And we were talking about pandemic threats, um, climate change, humanitarian crisis, mental health issues, um, which is a major public health problem, everything in an interconnected world with global travel information flow, with social pressure and with technological pressure. Um, and every time we have been talking about technologies, we were talking about technologies that have been produced, manufactured, uh, maybe developed, produced and manufactured in high income countries. However, I mean, technologies are good. Sometimes they were too expensive. They are too expensive or they do not do what they promise or they do not address the problems that are more pressing globally or that they are, are a problem in low income countries. So most of the technology comes from the high income countries and we have to deal with what we get. Um, so, we knew about all these things. And we were discussing also that the big challenge was how to adapt health systems to promote prevention and ensure access and care and to be resilient. And the discussion was, well, definitely we need to keep working on investments in research and innovation. And it's quite important to work in policy and action. And for that, implementation science, collaborations, catalytic funds, and sharing solutions. But you know, so then we were really struck with this pandemic. Although we were talking about it, we never believed that it was coming, okay? Um, there were shutdowns, um, even the military was, was there. In our case, in Peru and several countries in Latin America, because there is a lot of informal work People had to go to the streets anyway, because they needed to survive. People were suffering because of the lack of a good health system, the lack of oxygen, and uh, people had been dying. Peru, I'm from Peru. I'm born and raised in Peru, and I trained as a physician in, in, in Peru. Um, we are the champions unfortunately, having the highest rates of deaths per million in the world. So people started talking about words like solidarity and equity. But you know what? One of the things that had happened is that they don't exist in our real vocabulary, okay? During the pandemic, and um, as, as you have heard, I have been head of the National Institute of Health in Peru in, the, in 2008, 2006, and uh, I have been Minister of Health. And during the pandemic, I was called to be part of a, a group um, of experts trying to help the government on dealing with the lack of everything. So mainly, Peru, as many other countries, and I'm coming from Latin America, I'm gonna talk about the region of Latin America, during the 70s, technologies were being produced, manufactured, et cetera, but because of economies of scale, most of the countries decided not to go ahead and, and we could get everything cheaper coming from outside. 
But during the pandemic, there was, we were lacking even globes. We were not capable of accessing PPEs and um, diagnostic tests, forget it. Our capacities for molecular tests were not there. And of course, I mean, when vaccines arrived, see being a very small country, relatively small market, even and even having the money because we had gone through a very good economical situation. So we had a cushion for problems or for, for crises that could be used for the vaccines. We were not able to negotiate any vaccines and we started to vaccinate very, very late. And as it happened with several of the Latin American countries, once we were able to get the vaccines, when nobody else wanted to get vaccinated and, and in the North you were having vaccine hesitancy, what happened here is that as soon as we got the vaccine, everybody wanted to be vaccinated. And so far here in Peru, we're reaching 80%, almost 80% of vaccination. We have people that have received the second dose and for those that are very, very, say, with a very high risk, they may receive the third dose, okay? And we had been paying the highest rates for the vaccines, but it's worth it. So many people had died. So what are the kind of things that this, this situation is telling us, okay? I told you there is no solidarity and there is no equity in reality. Everybody was trying to do, although, I mean, I have been in workshops before the pandemic about who should be shared with what? I mean, if a country has this problem, I mean, how are you going to prioritize which country to start with? Uh, when, when the time came, nothing happened. So one of the issues for Latin America, and I have to talk because of Latin America, because uh, Africa has gotten a lot of attention in the past decades which is great. And I think what they are showing right now is that um, all the investments that have been made there are paying, okay? They are getting organized. Even for the pandemic, they had a CDC that was an African one and they tried to have, actually, I think they, they did have a, a response that was more regional. In Latin America, we didn't have that, okay? Not at all. Every country was doing whatever they could and, um, and that was not helpful. And, we are more unequal, at least 19% more unequal than Sub-Saharan Africa, 37% more unequal than East Asia, and 65% more unequal than any developed country. And as a region, we have been hit very hard. And at least two of the countries that are in the highest, at the top of deaths per million are in Latin America, Brazil and Peru, okay? And we know that in other countries like Bolivia, the counting of what has happened has not, that been, has not been that good too. So this is where I come from in Peru. So what we are talking now, what we are talking now is about the need of technological autonomy in the region. A Couple of days ago, I was at a meeting and finally we're trying to push to get together and say, we cannot, live like this so we need to be we need to have this technology independence if you want to call it like that so the question is how to do that so there is a need of having investors an economic model technical and consultants work on regulatory issues that are still bureaucratic and are not made for things that we can produce inside the country they are made for things that will come inside um, we need the promotion of local research and development and the participation of the private sector, but also of the academia, of the local councils for technology, which exist in all the countries. They may not have a lot of money, but they may have resources to work and to help coordinate things. And, uh, and we need also global partners. And when I said global partners, I include you, okay? And, and we need to work not only on the vaccines, because at some point we were lacking the availability of buying the syringes for the, for the vaccination, okay? Or the gloves that I was telling you. So we need to talk about really 
technology, sanitary technology. I think it's great that you're talking about the lab for vaccine, but I think it has to go a little beyond. We have to think about vaccine supplies treatments, which is another inequity that uh, probably will become worse, not better, if we have more um, options for a therapy coming out. And also diagnostics that are the ones that we usually are forgetting. So you're a university, a public university that is like the top in research funding. You have like 22 schools that are highly related, related and more than 6,000 faculty. And you have the possibility of working together and creating real partnerships to help regions like mine, for example, working on an economic model for the production of vaccines. I mean, it's not only that we are lacking the possibility of, of producing this um, COVID vaccine. In Peru, the only vaccine that we are producing, and we produce it through the National Institute of Health, is the veterinarian vaccine for rabies. And we have a couple of places where uh, private places places that uh, produce veterinarian vaccines. So how can we turn a manufacturer of veterinarian vaccines into human vaccines? It needs an economic model. And probably within the economic model, we can think about how to increase the production of other vaccines that are at risk, HPV. We have a great, at so far, we were able before the pandemic to reach almost 80% of vaccination for HPV. But the risk was that there was not going to be enough HPV vaccines in the world. So how can we deal with that? Well, with local production. So I think with the capacities, and maybe I'm preaching to the converters, okay? But I think it is quite important to try to approach differently collaborations, okay? And I think we need to work on collaborations between academic, because academic has a space, but we need to have also investment, we need funds, and we need to also to involve the private sectors into this big endeavor of improving technology. And when I talk about technology, as you could see, I mean, there are so many different disciplines involved because we have to make this sustainable. We have to make it, we have to make the technology a appropriate for the setting. Um, I share with you an article that we uh, published in The Lancet, I think it was in 2015. Um, I was working for the very first time on the landscape of diagnostics in low middle income countries. Why we don't get the type of diagnostics that you have, and when we get them, they are like 10 or 20 times more expensive. And by the way, we can use it in this, in the cities, but then when we need to use it in the rural areas, they don't work, okay? So what we did is we brought a group of developers of tests and we took them to health centers in the coast of Peru, in the Andean region and in the jungle. And they went, I mean, we took them to those places where we need technology to work. So we need to think also, and probably this is part of a co-creation process to working by working together, trying to define what type of technologies will be more appropriate for the whole world. And actually, even you in the United States, you have communities and populations that are far away that need certain conditions, not the ones that you have in very urban areas. So the things that you could develop together with us or work together with us could help also in your own country. So global health is not what you do in the North for the South. Otherwise, I will not be doing global health or I will be looking to do something in countries that are Southern on me. Global health is something that we could all share because we're sharing vulnerabilities. So I see the opportunity of working together there is a Quechua word for that, that is Cuscaya. So the Incas had a, this, this concept that working together was the best thing to solve problems. So they created the word Cuscaya. OK, 
okay? We need to Kuskaya, the North and the South. We need to think about co-creation. We need to think about multidisciplinarity. We need to think how can we really develop technological autonomy in countries because unless everybody is safe, nobody is going to be. So there is a lot that can be done. One of the things that I, I, I think are more important is probably this issue of not deciding what the country needs, but trying to explore together. And maybe you, can, you will see that some solutions may come and ideas may come from us, but the problem is that we don't have the money or the funding to do it. So maybe we can do it together. And I'm one of the big issues in, in the region of Latin America, and with that, we, I'm going to um, finish. Um, I think that catalytic investments can make really important changes. But one of the challenges that we have are like the political instability that we live on. But academy, the academy is very stable, and the private sector is too. It's small, but it's there. So I think maybe we have to, sh to shift a little bit and we should start working academia from both sides of the world with the private sector and try to see if we can come with some models that can help us to solve the problem of technology. Another problem is the implementation of the vaccines, issues that had to do with cultural issues. But I have to tell you, at least, we have been discussing between the different countries in Latin America, we have a culture of vaccines. Maybe that's something that you can learn from us, okay? How during the decades people has trust, has had gotten this trust for vaccines in general, and that has been helpful. And that is why very fast, as soon as we get the vaccines, people are queuing, are going there. And we have also, we know all the logistics and the epidemiological things that need to be done in order to vaccinate. So. That is one issue that maybe, and, and because when, when we're talking, it's like, I think it should be a two-way collaboration, things that we can share both together, working for a better world. And um, as get this German poet said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do, but we cannot do do it alone. I think we have to do it in a very symbiotic um, way. And Cesar Vallejo is a Peruvian poet. And um, this is from one of his most famous um, poems. There is brothers still very much to do. Thank you so much. And I said brothers and sisters, right? <laughs> Thank you. What the pandemic has shown us is that we have been doing globalization wrong, okay, in the wrong way. And at least we need to think about health security, right? Because there are issues that each con that that we need to have some autonomy. It's true that it's going to be very difficult that Peru, for example, be able to produce everything, okay? But maybe the model, and that this is something that we're discussing now, should be related to the autonomy in technology by regions. So that's what we are trying to do. So maybe Argentina will be able to produce the one type of vaccine, Brazil another one, uh, and Peru will produce the syringes that are needed. So I think we need to work on those. And I think it will be great to have some help of the economists and try to see how can we model the different ways of doing this. But I have no doubt that in the area of um, health, and I'm talking about diagnostics and, and vaccines and supplies, we need to have this technological autonomy. We need to have hubs of manufacturing all around the world, maybe not in each country, but we need to have them. It was impossible. I don't know if you have been doing some also research. I mean, I think it was, I have been doing research, okay? I, I was running a, a randomized trial, the solidarity trial here uh, from WHO testing some 
uh, drugs for COVID. I was running a plasma seroconvalescent trial. I was running the ivermectin trial to prove that didn't, well, that proved that didn't work. But, but the biggest problem was that we were not able to get any of the supplies that were needed because of the issues that we had with the pandemic. So the way we did it is we were sharing between universities and laboratories all the little things that we were having and, and that's how we work. So I think we need to rethink what globalization means, okay? And I think technological autonomy is here to stay and maybe it's not going to be country by country, but needs maybe we need to work regionally. And that's what we are trying to do in Latin America. That is what Africa is trying to do. Um, remember that India, for example, tried to produce vaccines. It was going to be the hub for others. But India is so big that they needed to produce for themselves. So that's what I think. And maybe this is something to throw you, right? Since I know that between you, you have people trained in policy, in um, economics, et cetera. Maybe we have maybe we should start thinking about how to model these, these different scenarios. But the fact is that we need to have that technological independence. Who cares in the world, for example, about HTLV? Okay, but the HTLV is a problem in our countries. So we have women mainly, also men, that will around 40 or 50 years old, we're not be able to walk. They will be in a wheelchair. We have people dying from lymphoma and nobody's working on really clinical trials or treatment or things that have to do with that disease. That's what I think. We need to think differently. And, um, and maybe regional is one way in which the model will work. But, it, um, but I have no doubt that, that autonomy is important. Well, there are two things that are important, I think, in Latin America. One is what uh, we call the decentralization or the regionalization, okay? And the second, the privatization. So not all the countries have gone into privatization. In Peru, for example, we still, 90% of the population, um, it's covered by the government through the Ministry of Health, 70% and 20, uh, less, a little less than 20% uh, by the social security system. But for example, Colombia, it's, they, they have this model in which they have uh, privatized. Um, so how has that affected primary care? Okay, there are countries that had prim primary care very well developed, okay? And some others didn't have that huge development. There are models that are incredible in Costa Rica and in Brazil, okay? But one thing that we share all is that we have been working for a long, long time on what we call the community health agents. So the community participating um, in, the, in, in the discussions and in the deployment or of certain activities that had to do with health. That has happened and still is happening, let me tell you, okay? Um, that has been, yes, an important factor for vaccines, but I think the work that PAHO, see, I mean, I'm, I'm not very happy with how ha PAHO has worked during the pandemic. I think the worst thing that happens with PAHO is that it's located in Washington, okay? It shouldn't be. And, um, but, but one thing that I, I really think they have done really great is how they have worked with countries to develop the capacities for delivering vaccines, for creating cold chains. And this has been PAHO and UNICEF in most of our countries. But not only that, the availability of the vaccines through the revolving fund which means that they buy a big amount of vaccines. We all ask for how much we want and because of economy of scale, they can get it cheaper. So we pay for them, but we can get quality vaccines with a guarantee of PAHO and at lower prices, okay? So I think it's not only the models of primary care, but also a very um, in intensive effort from PAHO, UNICEF, and the governments to work on what we knew because we believe in prevention. So 
and and nobody maybe this is cultural also okay this issue that you see in the us that you want and it's my right is my right i mean here is like let's, let's get vaccinated and let's get vaccinated because that's the way it should be so i think that's that's a very important issue it's not going to happen from one moment to the other but that's what i was telling you maybe you are medical anthropologist maybe you can try to un understand this is quite interesting okay i think what has been happening with a lot of information about vaccine hesitancy in the north has been and could have been more damaging for us because people was asking and why these gringos don't want to get vaccinated and all and because of the infodemia and the social media we get all the videos that you have and even translate it okay so it's like i think vaccine hesitancy could become contagious okay and so that's something that we need to study and 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 we need to see so i'm talking about different things the privatization maybe that has affect primary care but but i think that Vac the vaccine issue goes even beyond just primary care because primary care in Peru is very, very rudimentary. Although we have community health agents, but the services itself, um, the problem is that the translation of primary, primary to Spanish, a primario, it's taken as primitive. So it's a bad translation. It shouldn't, they, you shouldn't use an other word. And actually in, in primary care, you receive the most primitive um, uh, management. Okay, so um, sometimes they don't even have um, a stethoscope. So, if, I mean, they may have a stone to see if you have something in your brain. I mean, I, it's, it's not what it's supposed to be. Finally, the other issue that I think has really um created damage in our systems okay is um a the decentralization of regionalization which has not been done in the right way so most of the countries in latin america have huge cities mega cities okay where you can find lots of things but then outside the cities you have the regions that may have lower budgets you cannot find anything not even education the most important universities are just in the big cities in peru is just lima so the idea was to try to decentralize the funds and try to promote the growth of the rest of the country but this type of decentralization was done for all the sectors including health without creating the human capacities and without really having a good monitoring and and without thinking that maybe there are some public health functions that should not be decentralized. So what has happened for us, for example, is that we used to have a wonderful network, epidemiological network all around the country. Anything that could happen in one province as far as New York, Ecuador, immediately everybody will know and will take actions and, and even people from other regions will go to help. But because of the regionalization, each region has their own government. And sometimes because of political issues, the government doesn't want the rest of the regions to know that they are having a problem because they may look bad. And so our network of laboratories, our network for epidemiology, for example, has really weakened. And that has happened in several countries with the regionalization. So I think we, as a country, we need to think about that. We need to think how within the country we can be more interconnected to and how can we work as a country especially for certain issues so i think it's it's more than just privatization there are several things going around plus the contextual i think the contextual uh, issues happening in latin america all this political instability distrust to governments lots of informality which means that people could not really stay for quarantines all those things had really um, caused the worsening and, and, and the results that we have because of the pandemic with lots and lots and lots of death. 